Okay, good morning, everyone. So we're carrying on with our exploration of uh, simple population models in discrete time today. Last time we met uh, logistic growth models and we analyzed uh, steady states and stability. And we did that algebraically. Today, we are going to be looking at an alternative way that we can look at things using a geometric method known as cobwebbing. Okay, so I hope you guys have got something to draw with today because we'll be doing a fair bit of, of scaling. Okay, so what should you be able to do by the end of today? Well, you should understand this idea of cobwebbing and how to actually set these things up to, to analyze these models geometrically. And uh, this concept of something being asymptotic, okay? Um, that essentially means what happens in the long term. So you should be able to analyze these simple discrete time population models geometrically by the end of today. So what is this cobwebbing? Well, it's uh, a technique that we can use to analyze the stability of uh, these models. So previously we used this algebraic approach of um, assuming that we can neglect all these higher order nonlinear terms and just zoom in and focus on what's going on really, really close to our steady states because pretty much close to, if you zoom in enough, everything looks linear. So that was the algebraic way of doing it. Um, here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a diagram where we uh, move around that diagram based on our population size and our updating function, okay? So what we essentially have is this, this web diagram, this cobweb, shows how the population changes from one time step to another. So it's, it's a bit like a time series graph. Okay, so what do we have? You can think of these as, we're gonna set up a, an XY plane here. So you can think of these as just being XY coordinates. So this here is gonna be our initial population at N zero. And then we're going to say, how does that initial population change? Okay, so how do we go from N0 to N1? So this is essentially telling us about the updating in that first time step. And then we go back to saying, okay, here now we have moved on to this N1. And then we carry on and we do some updating. You can think of this as being like our N0 step, then we have some updating. Then down here, we have our N1, then we have some updating, then we have our N2 and so on. Okay, so that's the basic idea of what we're trying to do. So how do we actually construct this? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to set up some axes. So we set up our axes with our current population size N sub T on the horizontal axis and the next population size N sub T plus one on the vertical axis. So what does that look like? I'm going to zoom in and draw a little diagram here as we go along. So we have something like this, where we have nt here and nt plus one here. So that's the first step we do, we set up those axes. We're next going to sketch our net growth function. In fact, I might switch these things around. I'm gonna sketch the diagonal line first, because that's easier to do. Why do we want a diagonal line here? Let me sketch it first and let's do it in this color here. So diagonal line where NT is equal to NT plus one. Why do we want that? Well, if we just go back to this previous slide here, we have all these points here, N0, N0, N1, N1, and so on, N2, N2. So that's just the horizontal axis is equal to the vertical axis or horizontal component is equal to the vertical axis component okay so those would just be points along this gray line here okay what's the next thing we want to do like i said I've switched the order of these things this is actually number two now now we're going to sketch our net growth function okay so don't know what this is like suppose it looks something like this this is my f of nt this is going to tell me where i'm going to go to Okay, what next? So now we need to choose an initial condition N0 and then plot N0, N0. If you recall from this previous slide here, this was this first point that we're going to start at. So I'm going to choose an N0 here, no matter where I choose it. And I'm going to 
start at N0, N0. Okay, step number five. Since we know from the definition of our uh, population model, NT plus one, the population the next time, F of NT, so our net growth rate evaluated at our current population size, what's F of NT? Well, here we're actually doing F of N zero, because T is zero. We know what N zero is. N zero, <coughs> let me change things. Notability has been really annoying and has decided to update overnight and has changed where everything is located. So I can't see where dotted lines are at the moment. Not there. I'm just going to change the color instead. This vertical line here, this brown line, is just indicating all the points where we have N0, right? So F of N0 is just going to be this one here. So this point up here, if we just go straight up from N0, N0, this point here is going to be N0, N1, because N1 is F of N0. That was step five. We're now going to move horizontally to the diagonal line, to that gray line. So this is going from here horizontally along to this line here. Can anyone tell me what this point here is going to be? It's got you in that one. Oh, yeah. In one end, exactly. Yeah. And then all we do is we repeat that process. Okay. So this here, what I've just drawn out visually there, is just putting into a diagram what was on the previous slide, okay, this process. Okay. So we're just going to repeat that until the, the long-term, long-time asymptotic behavior comes clear. Remember, asymptotic just means what happens essentially as t tends towards infinity, or t gets really, really large. OK. What we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, the logistic model. and. We're going to set this up and then see if we can understand this using this cobwebbing approach. Okay. So recall from the last lecture that we had this model here is the logistic growth model. It says above logistic models, so you don't need that there. So we had our way of thinking about this is this is our future population, our current population. Remember, at times we refer to this as being our change in the population or our delta nt. Okay, so we've got our, what we've currently got plus some change. And this change we have R being our intrinsic growth rate. R is an intrinsic growth rate, the population. That intrinsic, if you recall, what it's saying is if we assume that there's no density-dependent effects on births or deaths, then this term in the bracket would disappear. And so the population would just grow or decay at the rate given by R. So that's why it's an intrinsic growth rate. It's essentially saying everything that doesn't include density dependence. And then K is our carrying capacity. That carrying capacity is based on the births and deaths, those, those rates. So we're going to sketch a cobweb diagram for this model, and we're going to use, because we're not going to, um, we're going to fix some of these parameters, we're going to set r is equal to a half. We don't actually have to fix a value for k, it turns out, but we do need to uh, think about this value of r. So that means, that first of all, we need to sketch our um, net growth rate function here, which I've just taken the n out the front. So how do we go about sketching this? Remember last time we talked a little bit about, you know, being able to sketch curves or lines and how best to do that? Mm -hmm. Things we need to know essentially are when does this function cross the axes? So f of zero is when n is zero, we're going to be crossing the vertical axis. And when f of n is equal to zero, then we're going to be crossing the horizontal axis. Okay, so we could solve this equation to find those values. Or substitute zero in to find the first value. We want to think about what happens as n gets large, so as n tends towards infinity. That will tell you about where this curve is going. And we might also want to look at what is the gradient at the steady states. 
So last time we talked about how that gradient of the steady states determines the stability. It's going to be the same thing here, but that will also help us sketch the curve. Okay, so let's think about these things. What do we need for our sketch? So what is f of zero equal to? Yep, zero. Reason why is because we've got this n out the front. So f of zero is equal to zero. So that means we know that we're, our curve is going to go through the origin. What else do we know? Let's think about... But we don't actually, turns out we don't actually need this bit. So I'm going to ignore that. It's a little bit harder to solve. What happens as f of n, as n gets big? What happens to our function n as n tends towards infinity? As n gets really, really large, what happens to f of n? No ideas? Breakdown. This thing out here is going to get large and positive, right? That's just population size getting larger. This is just a constant, so that doesn't matter. This is just a constant, but that constant is multiplied by this 1 minus n over k. So what's going to happen to 1 minus n over k as n gets really large? It's increasingly negative, okay? So we're going to have something that's increasingly positive times by something that's increasingly negative. So that's going to be tending towards what? Negative infinity, yeah, okay. So if you're not sure about how to, to do these, just try and break it down into different components and see, okay, we've got something positive here multiplied by something positive by something negative and so on. Okay, what else do we know? Well, let's look at the derivatives. Sometimes you can get away with sketching these without looking at the derivatives, but we will here. So f prime of n. So let's take our derivative with respect to n. We did this last time. We had 1 plus r minus 2rn over k. We have this 2rn over k on the end because we have an n squared term. That's this bit here multiplied by this bit here. That gives us an n squared. So when we take the derivative with respect to n, 2 comes out the front and we reduce the power by 1. Okay, so what we need to do now is we need to think about what is the gradient of our function at these different points at our steady states, 0 and k. We know these steady states from, from last lecture. So f prime of 0 is 1 plus r. And we know that this is greater than 1 if r is greater than 0. And we're going to assume that r is greater than 0. In fact, we're told that r is a half. Okay, So we know that this is greater than 1. Why does that matter? Well, we'll come back to that in a sec. f prime of k is 1 minus r. So remember, this one was a little bit more complicated. We had that 0 is less than f prime of k, less than 1, if r is less than 1. r is between 0 and 1. We had that this was between 1 and 2 if r was between 1 and 2. Oh, sorry, not getting ahead of myself there. This was between <coughs> zero low back. This was between minus 1 and 0 if r was between 1 and 2. And then it was less than minus one if r was greater than two. That was all from the last lecture. Okay. So we'll come back in a moment as to why that matters for this gradient. Let's have a go at sketching this cobweb diagram. So I'll sketch this, this one with you. Can anyone recall what's the first thing we need to do? First thing we need to do is set up our axes. Whenever sketching these things as well, 
I don't know why, but students often make them really, really tiny. Especially in exams, this is like a complete bugbear of mine. They'll do something like this. There'll be all this white space and there'll be a tiny little postage stamp of a diagram. Make your diagrams nice and big. Makes them a lot easier to mark. You're a lot more likely to pick up marks if we can see what you've done. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. Do we get bonus points if we make big diagrams? You might get a little smiley face there. You're just, yeah, maybe I should start doing that. Maybe I should start awarding bonus points. I'll think about it for, for, uh, for well-drawn graphs. Okay, that's more of a, a carrot than a stick approach, I suppose. So we put NT on our, our horizontal axis, NT plus one on our vertical axis, okay? Next thing we need to do, can anyone remember the next bit? Sir? Yep, we can do that. What's the other thing? That's that's good. That is what I originally had down. What was the other thing that, that I actually did first? Well, you just the day and all the yeah, so you can do these either way. There's no, there's no problem with doing them either way. Sometimes it's easier to do the diagonal here. Can you tell what's the gradient of this? Let me think. Let me write this slightly differently and see if it helps. If this is y and this is x. And I draw the line y is equal to x, what's the gradient of that? One. Okay, so same thing here. The gradient of this is one. Why do we care about that? Well, you might not. But we found out here that the gradient at our steady states here, for example, that zero was greater than one. So when we come now to write, let's sort of draw our our net growth function, our f of n, we know that the growth rate here has to be greater than one as we pass through zero. So I know that I've got to be above this line. Yeah. What else do I know? I know here we've set r is equal to a half here. So which of these three scenarios are we in here? We've got r less than one. So we know that when n is equal to k, or nt is equal to k, our f prime is going to be between 0 and 1. So this is 0, and suppose this is k over here. I know that the gradient, I'm going to intersect here, because it's a steady state, and my gradient is going to be between 0 and 1. So that means it's still going up, but crossing over, right? So this is helping me sketch what this looks like because I have these, these anchor points that I know I have to link up, okay? And if we link those up, we get something that looks like that. Not the best drawing, but it will do. Okay. So, can anyone remember the next thing that we need to do? Uh, so we, we, we don't have to worry about whether this is going off. To, I mean, in fact, this keeps in going on for a while, but we, we don't really care about what's going on beyond that. What was the next stage of our, of our cobweb diagram? Yep. Yep. So we need to pick an n naught. doesn't matter where we pick it. I'm going to pick it here. So it's going to be my n naught n naught. So that's my initial population. What's the next thing we do? N naught n one, right? So how do we work that out? Yep. Exactly. So we travel vertically until we hit this red curve. Note that if I had started over here, if this had been my n naught and naught, traveling vertically would have taken me down. So you don't necessarily go up, you don't necessarily go left or right, it all depends on where the curves are in relation to this diagonal. 
Okay, so this is my N0, N1. What do I do next? N1, N1. So that's just a horizontal line. Okay, in this case, going right to N1, N1. Okay. Carry on there and see what happens. Okay. So remember, all we're doing is we're going vertically, horizontally, vertically, horizontally, and so on. So I go up here. This will be my N1, N2. So my population is updating to that second time point. And I go along here, N2, N2, up. In general, I would you might want to write on what your N0 is, but you don't need to write what the, each of these coordinates are each time. Okay. This is just to illustrate to you what's going on. Okay, we go in there. If I had started over on this side, I would have come down here and then gone along and down and along. Okay. So we've got two steady states here. Now our steady states are where this diagonal intersects with our um, net growth function. That's because this diagonal line is nt plus one is equal to nt. So our next population is equal to our current population. So by, by definition, it's a steady state. So therefore, anywhere our growth function goes through that is also a steady state. So we have two steady states here in the, given by these purple dots, n is equal to k and n is equal to zero. So just looking at how these populations move, we don't need to know anything about the general solution. Remember the gen general solution of this, this type of function is nt is equal to lambda to the t uh, times by n0. If you didn't know that, you could just sketch this out and you could figure out what's going on in the long term. So we see from this steady state down here, we move away from it. If I had actually started much closer to it, you would have seen again, I would still keep moving away. That means that this is monotonically unstable. Gives you the same result as you would have had if you did the algebraic analysis, right? This one up here, the carrying capacity, we always tend towards it, no matter where we're coming from. We tend towards it just from one side, okay? So we're not switching over from one side to the other. That would mean it was oscillatory stable if we were converging. Here we're just approaching from one side. So this is monotonically stable. Okay. What I want you guys to do now is have a go at sketching the same cobweb diagram, but we're gonna be changing this R. So now we've got R is equal to three over two. What effect is this going to have? Well, if we go all the way back up here. Rather than being in this scenario now, R is going to be one and a half. So we'll be in this scenario here. So this means the gradient at the carrying capacity of my net growth rate is going to be negative. And it's going to be between zero and minus one. So it might help to think of what the, the line nt plus one is equal to minus nt looks like, because that's a line with gradient minus one. And this is a gradient minus a half, okay? Have a go at doing that and sketching this cobweb diagram. Again, I'll go around and help if anyone needs to. In fact, I'll leave this up here just to help clarify, but you're doing it with r is equal to three over two now, okay? Okay, let's have a... I'll run through and see how we're getting on. Like I said, it's like the main thing is often like knowing how to sketch these graphs. Um, and is an underappreciated skill is being able to sketch a curve accurately, okay? Um, but if you can do that, it gives you a lot of intuition as to what's going on. Okay, so let's go through this together. First thing I do is set up my axes. 
and then sketch on my diagonal. It's always good to label these things. Always make sure you label your axes as well. What do I know? Well, this the fact that I changed this R doesn't change my steady states. Remember, my steady states were 0 and K. So that means that I know that I'm still going to pass through this point here at 0. And I'm also going to pass through this point here at K when N, N T is equal to K. OK, what else do I know? I know from earlier on that my gradient, do it just here, sorry, I've got a, a toolbar on my right hand side, which makes it difficult to do. So my gradient at zero is one plus R, which is one plus three over two, which is going to be greater than one. OK, so that means that I know my gradient here is greater than one. The gradient of that diagonal line is one, so I know that I have to be above that line initially. At the carrying capacity k, the gradient was 1 minus r. So that's 1 minus 3 over 2, 1 minus a half. So what does that look like? Well, this diagonal line has gradient 1. A line that has gradient minus 1 would just look like that. We have gradient minus a half, so it's going to be somewhere in between that, OK? So it's going to be looking like this. So we're going up here, and we're going down here. That means, by definition, there must be a peak value, right? I must have gone up and reached some peak because I'm starting to come down, OK? You know, this is you're climbing a hill on this side, and you're coming down a hill on this side. You must have passed the top of the hill. So I don't know where exactly it happens. Suppose it's over here. I have to pass through the top of the hill before I can start coming down. So sometimes I said breaking it down into those different components and trying to sorry, find these little anchor points helps you to sketch these curves. Okay, now what do I need to do? I need to find an initial condition. I'm going to pick here, for example. Right, this is n naught, n naught. Now I go vertically, dot date, horizontally, vertically. Now when I go horizontally, I've gone above my carrying capacity. So what happens now, rather than going up, I come down. So my population size decreases when I update. I move along to here. Now I'm below my carrying capacity. So my population size can increase. Now I'm above my carrying capacity. Population size decreases. You notice every time I'm doing this, I'm spiraling in closer and closer to my steady state. In fact, if I keep doing this, eventually I'll move in really, really close. So in the long term, I'll tend towards it. So this steady state down here, the trivial extinction one, is still monotonically unstable because we're always just moving away from it. Here, can anyone tell me what this is? Close. Oscillatory stable. Yeah. Oscillatory stable. It's oscillatory because we're moving either side of it, whereas previously here, we approached it just from one side, the same side that we started on here. We're oscillating either side of it, but it's stable because we're moving closer and closer to it. Okay, so in the long term, we end, still end up at K. It's just we're going under and over, under and over, under and over. Okay, let's do one more. Now try this again but with r is 5 over 2. I'll leave this, so we're, I'll put it just here at the bottom so you can still see it. We're going to do it with now with r is 5 over 2. I'll leave this diagram up here to help. The key thing to remember here is the gradient 
I can draw it on in a different color, the gradient at this point here. This was a gradient of minus a half. So it's negative, but not too steep. Now we're gonna have an even steeper gradient and see what effect that has. Okay, have a go at that. Again, just put your hand up if you want some help. I'm happy to give some pointers. Just to make sure that's clear, we're now doing this for R is five over two. Yeah, okay, see if you if you've got it. So I'll go through this. So as before, our steady states aren't changing. It's just the gradients. And our gradient down here is one plus R. So this is going to be really high above one now. Over here, when NT is equal to K, remember we had <laughs> f prime of k is equal to one minus r. We have one minus five over two, it's minus three over two. So again, if it helps, you could do a mirror image of what a gradient of minus one would be like. This is minus one and a half. So it'll be more like this, okay? Steeper than we had before. So again, we know that we're gonna have a peak at some point before coming down. I'm going to extend this down even further now. We'll see why in a minute. Okay, so let's just pick a point. Try and tactically pick a point. I'm going to pick one here. Okay, so that was my initial population. I go up to my updating function. I go across. By the way, I've been a bit naughty here. I should write this as my updating functions. This is nt plus one is equal to f of nt. Always label your diagrams. Do as I say, not as I do sometimes. Okay, so this is my population at time point one. I now shoot up way above my carrying capacity. Go all the way over here. In fact, this might not have been a great example. Well, it's a, it's a reasonable example. Here, in this case, I've gone so high that I've actually driven my population extinct. Okay, there's just imagine this is uh, there's been a sudden a boom in the population. Next generation, there's just not enough resources to go around, and everyone dies. Okay, especially if you need a certain level of resources to survive, then everything dies. That's one possibility. Let's try and pick some, another value. I might have to work back and pick one. Did anyone get that before I carry on? Did anyone get that happening to them where the population goes extinct? Yeah, I see a couple of nods. Okay, that's not the only thing that can happen though. Let's try something. I'll start over. Let's see, I'm going to start over here this time. I'm going to work my way back. You see that your values can have a big effect from where you end up, where you start. Okay, so now again, I go over. This time I drop down. My population doesn't go extinct, it crashes but it's still there, okay? Now I go all the way back over here. Oh, that's not a very good line. Now I go up here, across. Population goes down again, this time not by as much. Now I go over here. Obviously I'm sketching this quite quickly. You can see, in this case, we're oscillating either side, but we're not tending towards that, that purple dot, we're not tending towards our carrying capacity, okay? So this is an example of something being what? How would you describe the stability of this? Oscillatory unstable. So one of the things that these cobwebs, if you draw, if you draw them accurately, for example, if you draw, uh, draw them on a computer, when we, when we find that something's oscillatory unstable, all we know is that it's oscillating and it's not going to tend towards that point. Okay? But we don't know anything more about it. Something that the geometric analysis tells us is the nature of that uh, oscillation. So you have to be really careful in how and, and uh, precise in how you sketch this. But if you sketch this very precisely, 
you would be able to say that for what values of R do we end up with the population, say, going extinct? What values of R do we end up with um, a cycle that just, say, goes all the way around? So one possibility when you sketch something like this is you might have a cobweb diagram that looks something like, let's see, Not a very good updating function. You might have a cobweb diagram that looks something along the lines of this, right? Did anyone get something that looked like that, where it was just going round in a square? Yeah. Okay. So that's the exa an example of something called a two cycle. It's essentially just oscillating between two values. I saw someone had an example of one that looked a bit more like. Let's see, this is kind of hard to sketch. One here. I'm going to end up with the same thing again, aren't I? I'll do it a little bit more exaggerated. Someone had something that looked a bit more. Kind of hard to do it without changing my updating function again. They had something that was more of a, it was oscillating between four values. Did I see yours, maybe? Yeah. So we're going to talk about this. It's a terrible sketch, so I apologize for that. Quite difficult to illustrate without changing everything. The point is the gradient that we have has a massive effect on the, the nature of these cycles. And we're going to talk about this next uh, lecture um, when we talk about things called bifurcations. We end up with things called period doubling bifurcations. So what it means is that as we increase the, uh, the net growth rate of these populations, we go through, we change the stability of the population, and it starts off being monotonically stable, and it's oscillatory stable, so we, we cycle in, and then it just cycles around this point, then it cycles around it with multiple stop-offs, say four different values, then eight different values, and 16 different values, and it ends up being chaotic in the end. We'll talk about what it means for something to, to be chaotic next time. Okay, that is it for today. There's um, another Jupyter workbook on Canvas if you want to work through an alternative model um, to have a go at uh, numerically doing a cobweb diagram. Okay. I'm here if you want to ask any questions. If not, you are free to go.